Half a day, everyone. Good morning, Buenas. Welcome back to the second day of the Pacific uh, Preservation Summit. We're so happy to be here. I'm really happy this morning because I got laid. And let me show you. Let me show you. I know what some of you are thinking. I am named after my grandmother, Linda, and we know that my great, 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 great grandmother was all over the Spanish documents from yesterday. So. <laughs> We are so happy that you're back with us. And yesterday, the first day, there was a lot of learning to be had and a lot to be shared about best practices in our region. So excited that we have things in technology like LIDAR. Uh, we have in Saipan, we have geocaching happening at the, the Garapan Heritage Trail. In Palau, they are doing um, QR codes at their historic sites. And then in Guam, we have a production for a virtual reality experience about World War II. And so all of this technology from this summit is really helping us to understand how we can better preserve and protect what we are all, what we all hold dear to our hearts. And so today, after our keynote address, you will all be heading to the Valley of the Lati in the beautiful village of Talafofo in the southern part of our island of Guam. And the Guam Preservation Trust has chartered about four, four buses that will be taking you to the Valley of the Lati after our keynote address this morning. And we know you're going to have a great time. And again, do not bribe the bus drivers to go to Ross, okay? People are like, don't do that. We can do it after. Perhaps we can do it after. Um, I, I am very happy once again to be here. And I'm going to call up one of our preservation partners, um, an advocate for preservation, Guam's very own State Historic Preservation Officer, Mr. Patrick Lujan, who will give our welcome remarks this morning. All right, good morning, everybody. I was actually gonna expand on the getting laid thing this morning, <laughs> and then I walked in and I saw a lot of kids, and so that kind of changed the narrative right there, right? So, uh, but before we get started, you know, we're talking about preservation and technology, uh, but we also have to think of ourselves, right? And, and the, not only the preservation of our, our body and our souls, but I guess you can call in some cases the rehabilitation too, right? So what I like to do in, in my office is to emphasize the importance of our body. We'll just do a little bit of stretching this morning before I get the day going. So if everyone can just kind of put your arms out like this, grab your other hand. Circle your ankles while you're sitting there. Right? It's like, you know, it's like that long flight up to Saipan, right? You get all uh, jet lag and the body gets all stiff. So just, yeah, turn it the other way, right? And your ankles. Now let's just go around our neck just a little bit. There you go. I'm feeling a little bit better this morning. We're going to have fun today. Um, for those of us who were not here yesterday, uh, you know, we had a good kickoff. You know, it's been a while, a couple of years since we got together. Uh, a lot of old faces, a lot of new faces. Uh, it's a very unique um, uh, community, the preservation community. It's very passionate, right? We're very passionate people of what we do on a daily basis. So it's very important that we always find time to get together and share. You know, I mean... You know, all the breakout sessions and everything, it's, it's good information to share, but it, nothing beats the face-to-face. -face. Nothing beats, you know, seeing uh, Rosalind and Joanne and all the archaeologists and, and all the preservationists that are, that are not only do work on Guam, but around the Pacific. Um, the new archaeologists from Saipan meeting you guys, you know, just having that same passion and that energy, right? It's always, it always is like a refresher that we, we, we get together sometimes and, uh, and do this. Unfortunately, not everybody uh, was able to come. FSM wasn't able to come, but we'll get there, right? This is, this is a good start of where we once were uh, before all the mask wearing and all the, you know, the, the health um, issues were, were going on. Uh, so, you know, the partnership with GPT has always been strong with the government, uh, us representing the government and trying to continue to evolve um, in, with, with technology. By the way, I wanted to ask, 
you know, yesterday, Polly Eric had his uh, iPad, or what's that? iPod, right? So who can beat that? Who has something in their purse or in their wallet that can beat something older than the iPod? You get a, you get a prize. Anybody? A pen. All right? Anything old? Oh, yes, she wins. Right on. <laughs> Tan Anna gets the prize. Uh, lastly, I wanted to also, you know, ask from you guys, what did you, you learn? So I'm going to go around a little bit and just tell us what was the biggest takeaway that you had from yesterday's event. So we'll start with, with Pete. Pete, what did you take away from yesterday? A good, a good takeaway, or <laughs> actually everything was great. You know, it's a lot of information that I didn't know about, and uh, visiting the historical buildings like the Luhan House, and then you know meeting Jesse and Ruby there, and how their music evolved. You know, is it's actually part of preservation with the music they share. Uh, so, so those of you that missed out on the Jesse and Ruby concert yesterday at four o'clock, or the the two for two. 245 session. That was great. It was a, a lot of uh, storytelling and also the preservation of music, right, and the language. Uh, Dr. Rosalind, what did you get out of yesterday's events? Oh, I just love all the face-to-face. -face. That's number one. Seeing people after two years of deprivation. So, so Dr. Rosalind does uh, DNA work, right? So I guess after so many years in the lab and just, uh, you know, talking to... Yeah, 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 see? Talking to living people, that's what she likes. So, something different. Uh, let's see. The archaeologist from Saipan. What did we get out of yesterday? Great, good answer. Thank you very much for that. He, too, is kind of like not used to talking to real people. All right, Brian, what do we got? What did we get out of yesterday? Again, it's just meeting all the people, all the passionate people about our, our beautiful island and the islands of the Pacific. And uh, the whole Pacific just needs to become one. That's all it is. And uh, we need to protect everything and uh, keep it going. But uh, I, I really enjoyed the uh, Polly talk yesterday because it was inspiring listening to him talk about it. And the thing about the, the Kamalan's dress from white to pink, that, that was really inspiring to me. Yeah, good. We all learned something new yesterday. Brian, by the way, is he's got one of the best jobs on island. Uh, he works every day up at Retidian. He's with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife, um, and he does tours up there and all the historic sites. So he's got he's got his own path and his own uh, dune buggy that can take you on a on a good tour. So love his job. Do you want to add something? Um. Hi, everyone. My name is Devani. I'm also from the island of Saipan. Thank you so much, number one, for having this summit where we can all get together. And I think something that I really took away from yesterday is not only are we using technology to empower our cultural heritage, but the fact that we are the ones who are utilizing these tools, that the locals are the ones who are sharing their stories versus our stories being shared for us. And I think that's really important. Thank you very much. Anybody else want to add something? Yes. Okay. I was impressed with the uh, community-based program in Yamare, and um, I wish that can be extended to the other villages in the island because the children, the school children, were actually engaged and involved with preservation and conservation of their village, and I. Um, suggested to Xavier Kinata that maybe he can reach out to the mayor's council and do a presentation so that all the kids on the island, um, you know, get involved with their uh, preservation and conservation in their village. Uh, because there's some village like Ta'i Chalampago, there was a concentration camp there, but where? Um, we have Menengan that is celebrated every year. What about Ta'i? You know, there's something celebrated in Jigo. You know, I mean, what about Father Duenas? You know, the history of Father Duenas, things like that. Thank you very much. Yes, that's very important. Even though we're emphasizing uh, the incorporation of technology and preservation, 
it still goes back to the humans, right? And, and absolutely. And so, yes, sure. Biggest takeaway yesterday is issues or events that occurred in the 70s is now his categorized as historic. What? What? No way. <laughs> yeah. So, so Ina's birthday is today, right? Ina's the architect. She's, go raise your hand. It's her birthday, right? And she's so proud, right? Today is not only her birthday, but she's one year away from hitting that historic category, right? I'm not, I'm not going to say what, what age that is, but she's like, wow, next year I'm going to be in that national historic category. I'm right behind her, by the way. So, um, did you have a comment? Yeah. All right. John Mark Joseph, the infamous John Mark Joseph. You know I always have comments. Uh, anyway, I just wanted to thank um, Rosalind and, and um, Joanne Eakin there um, for their, their work in the DNA um, and how that bought the present day DNA work that was done here with uh, Miguel uh, Valar with the National Geo, uh, and how their work at Natan Beach and all showed that his work was legit and, and, and they matched up so perfectly. And I'm thinking that that just came about through in England with the, uh, I think it was the Cheddar Man, that, that they matched the DNA to present day uh, individual, so now we know who his actual lineage is that's living today, so we can bring that past and the present together. I know the dis it's a small destruction of the bone, but how many people would not like to know, okay, that is my great, great ancestor's property or was his property, and that's where he lived at and all. As myself, I, I'm a mud. I've got, I'm Scottish, English. No, he's he's Chamorro. Doesn't he look like Chamorro? But no, good comments. And and those who missed the DNA sessions yesterday, my goodness, what a wealth of information. What a what an added value to to the history of our island, right? Just kind of confirming of that. Uh, and and I, you know, here's the two ladies that's been studying that. You know, Dr. Rosslyn, Dr. Joanne, thank you for doing that. You know, just in recent time, just in recent time, the, the history of Guam has changed, right, with, with the findings of the burials up at, at what is now Camp Blas, right? That's kind of rewritten the history of the Northern Plateau. So we're still evolving with what we do uh, from an archaeological standpoint, from a historical standpoint, from a cultural standpoint. And everybody in here are obviously passionate uh, with that, and it's always good to, to get together. Having the children come today, you know, I spoke to Emma and Jasper, right? Emma, Emma wants to open up a shop when she, she gets older, right? A clothing, and the brother's going to be selling Pokemon cards right next to her. Um, but who knows? After today and talking and seeing all of this stuff, they may, they may be archaeologists or osteologists or historic architects. Who knows? This is the time where us as elders... Um, present this and hopefully inspire our, our generation of, of next. Uh, enjoy today, enjoy our guest speaker, and I will see you in the bus. And, in, and who's, who's gone to the Valley of the Laddie before? Okay, maybe close to half. The first timers, this is their first time? Oh, that's a lot. Enjoy it, it's such a beautiful place. It takes you back in time, um, and it's something to, to definitely uh, look forward to. So on behalf of the State Historic Preservation Office and GPT, we welcome you to day number two. I think my battery's going down, but thank you, Patrick. And um, just another note, um, if you missed attending any of the sessions at the Guam legislature yesterday and any of the breakouts, or at CAHA, the Guam legislature has it on their YouTube channel, and the CAHA presentations also have it on their CAHA Facebook page, okay? Um, and so, without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like, it's my honor to introduce to you our keynote address this morning for day two of the Pacific Preservation Summit, Mr. Joseph Franquez. 
Mr. Franquez is an instructor at the University of Guam and serves as a member of the Guam War Survivors Foundation. This organization was formed in 2010 to tell the stories of Chamorro experiences of hardship and heroism during World War II and the Japanese occupation in Guam. The foundation hopes to preserve and protect the island's historical heritage with advances in technology. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me give a warm welcome to Mr. Joseph Franquez. Buenas and half a day. Now, I wanted to just say, after listening to the uh, uh, introduction today and uh, how Patrick was able to kind of capture all of the events that have been taking place since, and that you have such a wealth of knowledge and a wealth of understanding that we have to open our minds up and really allow ourselves to be able to absorb all of this information and appreciate it, and most especially where it came from. And I know that as we gather here today from all of the islands around our region, that we carry on that perspective of our heritage. And the, um, the cultural aspect of it really uh, connects us as more than we can even imagine how we're so interconnected, most especially when we talk about islands within our region. And near and far, we have a lot of opportunities to gather like this to be able to learn from one another some of the very significant things about our cultures. So welcome, everybody. Uh, as I was introduced earlier, uh, as Joseph, um, most of my friends and most people that know me will know me as Joey. So please refer to me as that. You are now my family and friends. Thank you. You know, I wanted to start off this morning, and I was looking at the original. Larry, can you go ahead and put that uh, opening uh, slide, please, of the, uh, the, uh, the program today, the summit? The very first slide of our opening, please. And what it was that really caught my attention about that was that we all share a language and different languages. And one of the first things that caught my attention there was all of the different languages, how we would say hello. And everybody knows Guam saying half a day, right? And so we have the others as well. Uh, can anyone uh, remember any of the other languages and how we, they say hello in those other islands? Tiro. Talofa. Yaque. Mogatin. Casalelia. Ali, right? And so when we hear some of these languages being spoken and how they would say welcome or hello, it really invites us to really open our minds to appreciate all of the different ways that we welcome one another, most especially in the islands. We have a very strong uh, way of, of communicating when we allow people to come in and share, right? That's what our culture is we allow them to come and share. So thank you very much. So half a day, buenas talu, half a day, todu samzu ni man matu gwini paogu na dia. Gof dankulu na tsidus maasi na matlo pida zu paogu gini ni Guam Preservation Trust. Zan malagu zu para bayu extendi hu zung loku ye dankulu na agradecimento para todu du siya itau to ni man sasono gwini na asuntu na na pidisenta paogu sa siya magahe. Lumii i minalago zan matu isinyantin guinaiza ni para upo mafata hujung esti pago na presentasyon para hita todos. Para tagosa, para taputehi, zan para tana open hujung para intero i tano na man magahit, man maulikit todos na tauta. Zan suka hafa guaha na masisese di pago gini di urizata, anisisita hit para hita para tafandanya, da tafanafa maulik, todo yung tempo. Da malago dito para bayo na iyam dito donklu na agradecimento pago na haan. Si Dios Masi. Pues, este pago na haani para tapresenta pago gwini i timelines. Da para tapintus dididi loku i po desti hafa i Remembrance Day. Da kuntodo loku i the wall. Hafa kumekaling niya the wall. 
kwe sumalum talus tina programa gwini siya i manapan hujung siya na ma publika siya na na leblu siya i trilogy and i sentimental journey za hafed zu na programa kwe ta kwentus didi lokwe put i teknologia technology zan partnerships hafen ay gofen put tantis ti pao para ta spia empenyo ni para ta pan tapan agwaiza tapan afamoli ta ta spia empenyo ni para ta protehi isti pao go todo do is to rata no sa man hahano sa man mama pus esta todo siya i manay nata dan isisita pa ta kumprendi hafen na reson na gofen put tanti para ita thank you very much so I'm here today representing the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation, and it was established back in 2009. And as we are today, we continue striving, looking for ways to um, invite others to be able to share some of these stories. And I wanted to just share with you that the mission of the uh, foundation is keeping the stories of Guam's World War II survivors alive and preserving their legacy, their legacy. And many times as we prepare to think about some of those stories, those that were told, those that are being preserved today, that there are countless numbers of others, other stories of those survivors from World War II that have still yet to be collected and archived and protected. And so that we have to really look at ways that we can do that using technology. So the War Survivors Memorial Foundation really takes it very, very seriously that these stories are precious and that they are valuable. And they are very valuable because the storytellers are not going to live for very much longer. Most of these individuals that experienced the war are already in their 90s, late 80s. And as we know that these individuals are very guarded today. They're very delicately guarded because we don't really know how much information they can still pass on at this point in their lives. That memory really is important that we capture it today. So I'm just going to be sharing with you photos and images of some of the th experiences that I've had since I became a part of this program. So June 28, as we all know, has been officially documented as Guam War Survivors Remembrance Day. So each day on June 28, we celebrate their stories. We celebrate the individuals that experienced World War II. And that the legacy and their heritage of war survivors known as the greatest generation should be recognized by all the people of Guam and all people in general and what it really meant for their generation to experience World War II as they did. So Every year on War Remembrance Day, we recognize and we celebrate. And in doing so, uh, we honor them and celebrate World War II survivors, not the legacy of the war, but their legacy of faith and resilience, keeping their legacy alive. So you see that in the images behind there, you see on the bottom portion of the slide, there's a long wall, and each one of those names that are on that wall have been listed by all of the accounted people that survived the war. And as you may or may not know, December 8 was one of those very significant days, the day that the war came to Guam. And many of the people that were here on that day experienced life in a totally different way from the how they had known it to be. So every year on December 8th, our war survivors are invited to attend a mass to celebrate that day, that occasion, Immaculate Conception, e Santa Maria Camelin, as we all know. 
And it makes them remember that day while they were in that church celebrating Santa Maria Camelin when the war broke out and the bombs started dropping and the word got out. You can imagine the panic that struck them and what was going to happen after that. So in these images, you see many of the survivors that are uh, participating there coming to share that moment again and recall that Remembrance Day and that we celebrate them by honoring them in that Mass. Notice that the wall, really, that I showed you earlier consists of 15,891 names. And that is a significant number because those were the courageous Chamorros who survived, died, or suffered during the war here on Guam. And of those 15,891, 14,721 of them, people of Guam who suffered personal injury, forced labor, forced march, or internment. Now, these are just the stories I want you to keep in mind, okay? And imagine those individuals, imagine those people going through this experience in their lives. And of that, 1,170 people of Guam who died during the invasion, occupation, and liberation of Guam. Again, this is a smaller uh, model of the wall that we saw earlier. And this wall represents those names. And those names of those individuals that are on this list are taken from uh, one place to another to show. And that same wall is available for you to see in one of the displays upstairs in the, um, the Guam historical uh, uh, display upstairs from the uh, Guam Museum. The next images you'll see here are some individuals who actually were survivors that had an opportunity to look at this wall and look at their names and to see that there were individuals there that were accounted for in this particular uh, project. And each one of them would come there to look for the names of their parents, their grandparents, maybe their sister, their brother, relatives, aunts and uncles. So I wanted to just kind of think about how we were able to compile all of this information. And as a result of that, the Warm War Survivors Memorial Foundation created the trilogy the trilogy are books that we have printed that really embody the stories and the legacies and even the pictures and photos of these individuals that we have no idea what they look like. And we were able to capture some of them and put them into a book that will really showcase who these individuals are and put a face to their name. The first trilogy came out in 2014, book one, entitled Real Faces. And as you can see that their faces are just painted in the front of this book. And that we can start relating to some of these individuals and seeing their faces and seeing that there will be things that we're going to learn about them that they experienced during the course of this time in their lives. The next book, book two, Families in the Face of Survival came out in 2016. And this one was to really capture most of the families that were involved with these survivors and telling their stories as well as they were told by their parents or grandparents. And you can see that many of the images in the posters here as we uh, laid out these, these um, events where they had these individuals come and they were able to present the books and also to share in their stories and also have them sign their books if they wanted to. 
and these individuals were there during this particular uh, event, signing books for them and telling their stories. And the third book was put out in 2017, Legacy Beyond Faces. And this particular book had a little bit more where it took the stories of those uh, individuals and moved, passed it forward to the next generation, their children. And one of the things that they passed on uh, in this particular case was the knowledge of music and how many of them that were musicians during the war and now have children that are musicians as well, myself included, um, have really taken that opportunity to engage with their parents in an activity that really changed the perspective of the war, in how they thought about the war, in what they were able to share about their stories. And music has always been a part of my life. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today, really. And I wanted to just share with you that music really binds us and it connects us all. And that when I found that calling, if you will, to be a part of the Guam War Survivors Memorial Foundation, it was because of my father and my mother, of course, but mostly because of my dad. My dad was a musician, just like I am, and he really taught me a lot about how music can change the way people feel and that it is a part of the emotions that comes out of your heart and that when you play music, whether you play it in one area or in another, people seem to gather. Then it really just allows them to express themselves in a way that they want to. Some in, by dancing, some really just going out there and wanting to get up there and perform themselves. But music is a very strong, strong platform. How musically inclined people want to be able to perform. So. At that point in 2016, when I joined the organization, I became very interested in how I can take the legacy of music from my father to be able to share with the others and at the same time honor the survivors. Because honoring the survivors has always been my main mission, honoring the survivors. And so how could I do that? And what technology is available for me to do that? And how can I use that technology? Technology really can uh, help us to maintain information, obviously. Today, we have many ways to do that. And when we think about the past and how that information was passed on from one to the other, we know that it was passed on verbally. It was passed on word of mouth. Father to son, mother to daughter, or mother to son. It was passed on in that way, and it was maintained that way. Now. We have to think about how music was passed on, and we did that in the way of chants and in dance. And so music still was a very strong element of our culture. And that I thought, what a wonderful medium to be able to share that history and honor the survivors at the same time. So we, brand, we created the brand Sentimental Journey. And Sentimental Journey really, and the story behind it really was just that that it allowed for those, those moments and in that era that the music that was being produced and performed during that era really captured a very special time in musical history. And it also did that here on Guam because we were already listening to all the different types of music. And I know that growing up, I was listening to all the different types of music from the swing era. My dad played a lot and um, I grew up listening to that. That era of music was very lively, very vibrant to me. And so I was really captured by that and how I can really use this platform to be able to honor the survivors. So Sentimental Journey became a reality in 2016. So what we did was we created a program and a show, if you will. And this show was a wonderful experience for me, along with my colleague, Brenda Sana, Paris and uh, our administrative consultant, Norma Affligui, we became very passionate about how we can create 
a program, a show, to showcase our music of the era and also to honor our survivors. One of the things that happened in this year was that it was so successful that people wanted to see it again. So that year, we created Sentimental Journey, and then we also had the Encore. And that was a very special time because we were able to take something and really recreate another opportunity where there was just not enough time in one show to present it to all the people that wanted to watch it. They were turning people away at the door because they just not enough seats for them to come in. So what we did with the encore was we allowed them to do that by putting on a show twice in one evening. And that was a challenge. So the encore performance was wonderful because it was a sold out event. And of course, that really helps to really allow the, the survivors to be a part of that as well and sharing their stories and enjoying the evening musically with them. In 2017, we had the Hats Off Sentimental Journey 2. And Hats Off was really a, a, a concept that we wanted to share regarding everybody that could associate with wearing a hat. And how music really tied into that was that you can imagine that people walked around Guam and they were wearing hats. And that everybody that had a hat was able to stand up and participate in the audience with that hat. So everybody had an opportunity to participate in that particular uh, concert in that way. The next year, 2018, the thought about having strictly a Guam musical production. So we took all of the Guam Chamorro performers that I knew of, and you can see many of them in that poster there. Um, and I gathered all of them to be able to think about all of the different musical elements that we have composed here as performers. And I gathered them together to be able to present to our war survivors Guput Samoru. And I thought about what Guput Samoru really means. And as, as everyone knows that when a Chamorro gathering occurs that we celebrate many different aspects of our culture, food, music, definitely, and the opportunity to get together and reconnect, telling those stories, making those stories be a part of our generation. Because the generations that we want to try to honor and keep their stories alive will be continued on in our generation and the generations to come. And I want you to really keep that in mind because it's really going to come up to who's going to be that. Then it came to a point where in 2019, um, of course, some of these productions really are quite expensive to put together. And of course, money doesn't come very easily. And we started to find ways to be creative. And having a concert face to face really cost quite a bit. But we thought of how we can change that and maybe save some money on the side and really capture the same element of music. And what we did that year was we were able to recapture some of the music uh, that was already produced. And so we came up with the replay concept and preserving some of the music that was already popular in the era and on through to present day. Sentimental Journey 4, Guam Remembered. The, um, this particular Sentimental Journey project also was a uh, collected musical element where we were able to uh, present it in a CD. And CDs, as we all know, are things that are starting to phase out already. Not very often that we have to uh, carry around a, a disc full of information these days. And that's just one other technology that we can consider in preserving some of that information. And that's what we wanted to do here, so that we can be able to share that and allow people to have it and be able to play it over and over and watch it over and over. Which kind of brings me back to the first sentimental journey, because that particular event, as successful as it was, was not recorded. 
it was recorded by audio only, not by video. So we didn't have the visual aspect of the concert, but believe me, if we could turn back time, that would be one concert. I wish we would have had enough money to be able to do that. So now that we're moving forward with the technology being changed now and going into this concept of just watching a video and being able to replay it countless, numerous times, how many people will be able to have the opportunity to watch over and over? The next sentimental journey, we were able to capture the spirit of the Chamorro people, of the survivors, and those individuals that really were able to thrive and to bring that joy out of their spirits while they're dancing. And if you've ever been to the uh, Chamorro Village on Wednesday night, these two individuals were definitely an icon there. And I want you to know that when we captured this particular photo of them dancing, it really captured the idea behind the spirit of the dance itself. And that this particular production was focusing on their dance and dancing in general of our survivors enjoying their lives today. And last but not least, this is our fifth sentimental journey, and this year's production is entitled A Chamorro Symphony. And this particular symphony concept really was brought on by the music of Jack DeMello. And as classically um, produced as it was, a lot of people really didn't take um, an open mind perspective to why Jack DeMello's production and his original uh, com compositions of our music, the Chamorro music, that is. And he really made that a very um, highly produced, uh, orchestrated uh, symphony of music for me, and it captured my attention. And I thought, what a wonderful way this year to be able to listen to the Chamorro music being performed by the London Symphony, conducted by Mr. Jack DeMello. And this production was uh, put out in 1979, and it was produced on vinyl and on CD. Um, and um, we're still able to uh, be able to get that today to listen to it. So I took this sentimental journey this year and uh, created it around the theme of the symphony. A Chamorro symphony is really about that, the musical elements of Chamorro and being performed by an orchestra and also to have all of the elements of a symphony created with Chamorro performers singing those songs. So that's what's in store for you in this, as a surprise take on it today. So that's pretty much what Sentimental Journey is. And we can see how music, and uh, as Patrick mentioned earlier, how Jesse and Ruby were able, also musicians, uh, were able to take the music and really make that be the platform of teaching a language. And that's been one of my own personal uh, ways of teaching language as well. So I think that everybody really is able to understand and appreciate the language and also musically remember it as well. So when we get into the theme of technology today, we think about some of the things that we can do with it. And one of those things are, uh, what kinds of technology is there? And who has access to this technology? And how is it being used today? How was it used back then? You can imagine the different types of technology back in our ancient period when the technologies then was basically just trying to survive. And we had such a wealth of cultural heritage that we learned from them. And we took those um, stories being passed on and they existed in our canoe building. It also existed in our storytelling. It also existed in our chants in keeping and maintaining those stories. And what can we do with this technology today in preserving, in collecting, and storing this data? Where do we uh, store the information is important because once we start collecting this information, we need to find a place to put it. And that is going to be one of the challenges 
that I would like to present today. And if you have some ideas on how we can do that, that's what we are going to do. Talk about that. How much is it going to cost to do something like this? Right? In our minds, we can think of many, many different ways, strategies and, 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 and examples that we can use to, to create that. And how can we also find the funding to do that as well? So technology really is available for all of us. Each and every one of us knows that we have technology and the different kinds of technology that we can use today to do that in collecting and storing and being able to retrieve that information when we store it is really important. I can only imagine with regard to storing the data from DNA and how you're able to take that information and put it somewhere and be able to go back and find it again. And that even works for our own mind, right? In our own minds and in our brains functioning that same way. If we put it somewhere in our brain, we forget how to call it back. So I think those are really important in how technology really makes that a little bit um, less difficult and more achievable. One of the things that we can also do in doing this is really finding out how we can preserve this information and how we're going to be able to network. And networking is really important. Um, since 2009, we've had the, the wall traveling from one place to another, showing the names of all of these individuals that we honor during that period in time. And of course, there are publications that we put out in the media that tells where these uh, displays are going to take place. And also, what we can do with all of this also is to be able to allow the next generation of individuals, our children and grandchildren, to be able to be a part of that because they're the ones that are going to take it forward. We're at the point now where we consider ourselves the Menomco, right? And when I think about the Menomco, I always think about my parents. And now that they're gone, I represent my parents and their stories and my experiences will live on in me and I pass that on to my children and my grandchildren as well. So keeping the youth involved in this really these youth camps are really important in allowing these students to be able to hear these stories from the actual war survivors so that they'll be able to share that information as well with each other and keeping their stories alive. Some of the ideas that came up as a result of this Sentimental Journey project was in keeping their stories is we need to find these partnerships and how we can create these partnerships really involve connectivity, how we can interconnect with each other and share these stories and share these ideas. The public and the private organizations, entities, businesses, individuals really have a big part in this because if they don't buy into the program or into that idea, then it's really just an idea and we need to put it into some form of, of action that we can start to accomplish some of those tasks. Another place that we can store information is here at the Guam Museum. And thank goodness that we have a museum to call our own, to show our heritage, our culture, and our history. And this is a wealth of knowledge and information that we can store here as well. The Guam Preservation Trust, they're doing that right now as we sit here in this, in this um, venue in sharing these stories and ideas. So there's another opportunity for us to create partnerships. Just earlier, uh, Nicole came up to me and said, how can we get together? I'd love for you to be a part of you coming in to listen to some of the ideas that we have with our organization. And maybe with your knowledge, we can come together and form this partnership. And that works for me. And I'm open to that as well. So just want to see Nicole. We definitely look upon telecommunications because really without their interaction and their involvement in the process, that information is only going to be mobile. Here, there, it's going to be able to be taken from here and used somewhere else and stored somewhere else. 
and we'll be able to use this technology to be able to share this information one, one way or both ways in many different ways. So those are ideas that we can use in building partnerships. And I appreciate the fact that you can see some of those individuals that are involved in this particular sentimental journey project was the, um, the uh, governor's office. We have also the Survivors Memorial Foundation. We have Guam Economic Development Authority. We have KUAM. We have PBS Guam. We also have Shooting Star Production. And these companies are all involved in this project and making it useful and making it very achievable and making it very uh, uh, attainable for others to be able to view and watch and appreciate. So we want to be definitely consider the creating of a repository, which is one really wonderful opportunity for us to be able to consider. And that preserving their stories would be one of the very, very important uh, aspects of this uh, re repository. That we are going to have the youth be involved in this, in collecting this information as they go with their little cell phone and they can actually record a story of their grandparents or their aunt or their uncle as they're telling their experience of the war and record that. But where do they go after they've done that? Facebook? Maybe, yes, that's one way. Uh, we can WhatsApp it to one another. We can tweet it. We can Instagram it. We can do so many different things in many different media. So that's available to them right at their fingertips. And our family members are the key element of this as well because we are the ones that are hearing these stories directly from our survivors. Groups and organizations definitely need to be involved in this because they also have the mechanisms and the, uh, the resources to be able to use and be able to make these um, ideas come to fruition. So who will continue to tell their stories? And can technology do this? I believe that it can. I want you to keep that in mind today. And maybe if you have a story or you have a, an elder uh, relative that you want to collect their information and share with others, that's an opportunity for us to maintain it that way as well. So what is your story going to be? How are you going to be able to capture that information and be able to keep it and preserve it and to share it? You can see here that uh, Penlana is one individual that has her daughter standing next to her and that they are going to be the ones that will tell her story to the generations to come. So on that note, I really appreciate your attention today. I hope that you enjoy the rest of your day in your tour going down to the Valley of the Lati. And I appreciate you. And uh, I would like to just say, Adios.